Washington today, the Occupy Wall Street protesters began voluntarily vacating Freedom Plaza in order to make way for the crowds that will assemble for this weekend's Martin Luther King Memorial Dedication. Tomorrow in Washington, the Reverend Al Sharpton will lead the March for Jobs and Justice. The march will be held by thousands of members of the civil rights community and all those who continue to push for jobs and justice. Republican presidential candidate Rick Perry today finally revealed his up to now secret jobs plan. You know, the one he wasn't prepared to discuss in this week's debate. We've got to have a president who is willing to, to stand up uh, and to clearly pull back those regulations that are strangling uh, the American uh, entrepreneurship that's out there. A president, particularly with the plan that I'm going to be laying out over the next three days, and I'm not going to lay it out all for you tonight. Uh, you know, Mitt's had six years to be working on a plan. I've been in this for about eight weeks. Perry calls his jobs plan energizing American jobs and security. It puts Perry in a tight competition with Herman Cain for most ridiculous jobs plan of the year. The Perry plan pretends that it would create 1.2 million jobs simply by opening new and protected federal land for oil and natural gas production. It is the Texans way of trying to cross dress drill baby drill into a jobs plan. Governor Perry and his wife are now double teaming Herman Cain on the 999 plan. When I hear 999, I want to call 911 because it will raise the taxes. I think that's pretty close to hitting the spot. Joining me now is the Reverend Al Sharpton, host of MSNBC's Politics Nation. Thanks for joining me tonight, Al. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, so you're marching for jobs tomorrow. I don't know. You might want to. You might want to just relax because Rick Perry just said all we have to do is open up federal lands and drill some more, and we're going to have, uh, you know, more than a million jobs for for all those people out there who you know need jobs. Well, you know, if <laughs> if I wasn't going to march tomorrow after hearing <laughs> of uh, Mr. Perry's Texas oil plan and Mr. Kane's 999, I'm ready to march even further than we had planned. I mean, it is absolutely incredible to me. We had originally planned Nash Action Network and the labor unions and, and uh, Urban League to do this march in August when the King Memorial was going to be dedicated. We moved it to uh, tomorrow, the day before. And it is a better and more appropriate time, Lawrence, now, because we saw just this week the Senate stop the president's job plan for 1.9 million, and the Republicans have no job plan. So if there ever was a time for the civil rights community and labor community to come together in the name of Martin Luther King, it is uh, now, on a week that we've seen this, when we see these, these uh, demonstrations all over the, the country and now tomorrow parts of the world, with Occupation Wall Street. People are tired of this. And uh, ironically, Martin Luther King preached about this. He died fighting for labor rights, for jobs, and for economic equity. So Martin Luther King III will join us in leading this march tomorrow from Lincoln Memorial to the King Monument. Uh, Al, I have to get your reaction to what happened in New York City this morning on the Occupy Wall Street uh, demonstration. There was that showdown that was coming. It seemed very uh, threatening as of this time last night that something really terrible could have happened this morning. No one has more experience in street demonstrations in New York City than you do. Uh, were you surprised by this thing being diffused at the last minute? I was, but I was glad. Uh, one, because I think I was there Monday uh, uh, down uh, at the park. I spent most of the day there, did my syndicated radio show from there. And these are very sincere and passionate people, young and old. And I think that what they're raising is important. And I was afraid that if there was a confrontation, they having the righteous indignation of a just cause, being confronted by, if you just had one policeman that would overreact, it could cause a problem. I was glad to see, for whatever reasons, uh, it uh, not go to that. I hope it will not go to that. Because first of all, let's be real clear. The, the real object down at Wall Street is not cleaning up a park. 
is cleaning up Wall Street. It's cleaning up policies that have made 1% of this country control 40%. They're trying to clean up the wrong thing. They need to, as Michael Moore just said on your show, be perk walking the people that have polluted and poisoned the economic order in this country. So you're talking about picking up some cots and some papers in one park while you're allowing people to break this economy. I think that the wrong sanitation is being emphasized down there. Uh, Al, I, I have to say, I think that the Republican campaign of, of all of the candidates, their, uh, their approach to jobs so far has been extremely helpful to President Obama's re-election campaign. You have Rick Perry uh, saying today that creating jobs is as simple as changing presidents. Uh, he just, you know, he reduces it to just that. When this president is the only one who's come out with an actual jobs bill, uh, fully specified, fully paid for, uh, trying to get it to a vote in the United States Senate, being denied by Republicans getting it to a vote in the Senate, uh, being denied so far by Republicans being uh, uh, getting it to a vote, even just to a vote in the House of Representatives. Uh, it seems to me that as, as, as the Republicans continue to do absolutely nothing, the president, the only one out there in, in our politics pushing a real jobs plan, that is as, as good a dynamic as the president could ask for in re-election terms. Bad for the country, bad for policy. But in re-election terms, the president seems to have the real advantage here. No, there's no question about it. It's the old put a clean glass next to a dirty glass. When you look at the fact that the president's bill would have produced 1.9 million jobs, and he comes back and says, well, let's even vote for it in parts, the Republicans respond by an abortion bill in the House. I mean, how do we go from dealing with the fact that we have 9.1% unemployment, that we have a 7% decrease over the last decade in income, and we're going to keep arguing about issues that don't deal with the economic problems that we're facing, and then the Republican candidates come with gimmicks, tricks, or how do we reward the rich, including this 999, which would only put an additional tax burden on the people that are already overburdened. So in that political landscape, the president clearly is the one ahead in terms of having a plan. Who are the losers are the American people, because in the name of partisan politics, they're blocking the president, and they have no plan of their own. There's not competing plans. There's a plan versus no plan. In that light, the people must speak, which is why Occupy Wall Street is right, which is why the march tomorrow is right. We're going to be announcing 25 cities we're moving in after tomorrow simultaneously. Tomorrow is the beginning, not the end, of the civil rights and labor community fighting back. Reverend Al Sharpton, thanks for joining me tonight, and thanks for previewing this important upcoming weekend in Washington. Well, I know how to have the last word before March. You just got it. Thank you very much, <laughs> Al. Thank you, Lars.